and she's on a first name basis with Prince. Please welcome Vanity. In February 2016, the world woke up to shocking news that Canadian singer and actress Vanity had passed on, aged only 57. She was an exceptional singer, but more famously she was known as the woman pop singer Prince, introduced to the world. Together the two late artists experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly. Literally. In case you're getting lost, here is one of her most famous songs. But apart from her unforgettable singing, stinging vocals, and raunchy dressing, Vanity, real name Denise Matthews, was also famous for dating legendary singer Prince, a relationship that otherwise turned tragic. Prince, as you may be aware, was a man of many women, and he and Vanity met in the mid 80s according to the late singer. The other of Prince's loves was his protege, Denise Matthews. The former model who became a singer began dating Prince after meeting him at the American Music Awards in the 1980s. And from how she later spoke of him, it's clear Prince really hurt Vanity. Uh, now tell me a little bit about uh, your relationship with Prince. Do you still, do you still see him? Do you, are you guys friendly? Or, uh, no. Um, you're not no, friendly? Not, friendly. <laughs> not that we're not friendly. We don't see each other, mm -hmm. but we're friendly when we see each other. Mm -hmm. So what really happened between the two? And was Prince somehow connected to her death? Sit back and relax because we are about to burst the secret wide open. Denise Matthews, the singer, model, and actress known as Vanity, who toured with Prince in the 1980s before eschewing her wild persona for life as a minister, died in 2016 aged only 57, and now shocking details of her last days alive and subsequent death are hitting the headlines. Vanity met Prince at the American Music Awards in 1980, and the two soon became romantically involved. He also invited her to be a part of Vanity Six, the funky, erotically charged girl group that had a hit in 1982 with Nasty Girl and toured with Prince. She appeared on the cover of Rolling Stone with Prince in a portrait shot by Richard Avedon, with her hands creeping down the front of his pants. Prince, in his first motion picture, Vanity was supposed to play the lead female role in Purple Rain, the semi-autobiographical Prince film that was a box office hit in 1984, but abandoned the project before filming began. She went on to release two albums as a solo artist with Motown, Wild Animal, and Skin on Skin. She thrived on raciness, often performing in lingerie. My music is very sad, so you could say I'm just putting all of me out there, she told the Associated Press in 1985. Um, I had Jet Magazine in my house yesterday, and we were talking, and he said to me, Denise, he said, you know, he calls me Denise now. <laughs> Hallelujah. She was on the cover of Playboy in 1988. As an actress, she appeared on television and in films including The Last Dragon, Never Too Young to Die, Action Jackson, and 52 Pickup. But by her own later admission, Vanity led a fast life, which took its toll. In an interview with Jet Magazine in 1993, she said she had been extremely wild in her younger days. There was a lot of cocaine, she said. I tried men, women, everything. I didn't snort cocaine, I smoked it. It is widely believed that Prince played a crucial role in introducing young Vanity to drugs. The singer told Jet that her drug use had nearly f***ed her. She had had renal failure a few years earlier and was told by doctors that she had only three days to live. Who are you? I am Leroy. <laughs> Leroy Green. It's nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> After that experience, her life took a religious turn. She left the name Vanity behind and became a Christian evangelist. All I had become was thus painted on my face, Vanity, she later wrote on a personal website. According to her sister, Vanity eventually became an ordained minister and preached in churches around the country. She published an autobiography in 1999, Blame It on Vanity. As earlier mentioned, it was Prince who christened her Vanity after initially daring her to go by the much more provocative before building the girl group Vanity 6 around her. This was the early 80s, Dirty Mind era Prince at his most driven, so his new girl group was a hypersexual take on James's own Mary Jane girls, and they were given some of Prince's most salacious songs, including the hit single Nasty Girl. The song would go on to influence later tracks from starlets like Kaylee's and Britney Spears, and it made stars of the group and a vanity, who would become Prince's muse for the next two years. 
She later said that the image Prince crafted for her made her uncomfortable, and she felt coerced into it but came to accept it. I did it because Prince told me I had to do it, she told Aldor Collier in a 1993 interview with Jet. If I didn't do it, I wouldn't get paid. I got into it. I wanted the old Diana Ross image. Pundits argue that it is this uncomfortable image that drove Vanity to drugs, something that she thought could help her cope with the pressure of being a star. After splitting from Vanity 6 and Prince prior to his leap into megastardom with Purple Rain, Vanity signed with Motown. Her first solo album was built on the an image she'd cultivated under Prince, but without his songwriting and production, the project underperformed. Nonetheless, she was cast as the female lead in a martial arts fantasy film from Motown Productions, 1985's The Last Dragon. Grossing under $26 million at the box office, The Last Dragon wasn't exactly a hit, but the movie introduced Vanity as a prominent leading lady and would go on to become a celebrated slice of campy 80s cinema. She would follow up her appearance in Dragon with another album for Motown, but outside of the moderate dance, hit Under the Influence, Skin on Skin, also underwhelmed, and aside from a song on the Action Jackson soundtrack, Vanity's years as a pop star were behind her. She'd begun dating Motley Crue bassist Nikki Six that year, and in 1987, they became engaged. The couple was heavy into 80s rock star excesses and enabled each other's drug abuse. According to Six's biography, the two were compulsive crack addicts. I can't believe I did freebase with Vanity all night, Six writes in one anecdote. I threw her out at about 8 a.m. She was getting crazy and telling me about God. Six famously also had a near-death overdose in 1987, and in 1994, Vanity overdosed on crack cocaine. The experience almost killed her, profoundly affecting her health and forever changing her outlook. My blood pressure was 250 over 190. I lost both kidneys, she told Jet writer Margina Christian in 2007. I had internal bleeding with blood clots on the brain. I was completely blind and deaf. I had a heart attack and a stroke. It is that experience that later led to her religious conversion, as she said that she'd received a vision from Jesus as she lay dying. She said that God wanted her to metaphorically kill vanity, and she did reportedly discarding every interviewer recording of herself as the sexed-up pop star, distancing herself from the entertainment world, and going by her given name only, Denise Matthews. She also completely and entirely distanced herself from Prince. She would marry former LA Rams player Anthony Smith the following year, who once playfully complained about his wife's newfound zest for life and helping others. If I don't watch out, she will even hand out the furniture in our house. She is constantly giving out her number and offering meals and showers to people," Smith said. But by 1996, the marriage was over. Smith is now serving three life sentences for the 1999 double murder of brothers Ricky and Kevin Nettles and the 2001 death of Dennis Henderson. But Vanity's convictions as a Christian had only grown. She would become an evangelist in the late 90s, speaking and writing about her faith and her past, and hoping to offer some clarity to other lost souls. She would later write in her book about her time as Vanity. With each new, methodical, despicable movement of my being, I closed my fists around a wretched lie which sought to eradicate my life at an impromptu time, and I had built no stomach for the fight. With each new bitterness dispelled by this cruel, cold world of which I had become its strange kind, I shut my eyes and with deep complaint muttered words of death and despair while the hot flame seeped, boiled, and burned ablaze under my bottle. I was molding to the likes of mediocrity, vulnerability, having had all the experience of a trained seal, being pushed to the brink of hopelessness, and helpless to perpetuate a flawless, ruinous end. The singer admitted to Vibe in 2008 that it wasn't easy to get people to forget vanity. Getting past my past was a process, a very serious process indeed, my god, as a person, I'm constantly changing, trying to be better. Back when I was vanity, it was all about being getting slimmer and getting cuter. Things have changed. Now it's not the outward appearance, it's the inward man that I'm trying to change. And that's the message I bring to the people. Despite her evident struggles, the death of Vanity was heartbreaking for anyone who grew up a fan of R&B and black pop culture in the 1980s. 
Granted, in her heyday, she was a mainstream star with pop hits and movie and TV credits. Typically beautiful, Vanity was perhaps the earliest on-screen crush of many men, and it was rare for them to see beautiful black women presented as the desirable female lead in movies. Vanity was as glamorous and gorgeous as any iconic beauty of that generation. But Vanity wasn't who Denise Matthews was in the last two decades of her life. Maybe she was never Vanity. Maybe the drugs and recklessness were how she helped Denise cope with Vanity. Regardless, what's beautiful to anyone who loved her as a friend or as a fan is that she found her peace on her own terms and never looked back. And I think it's important to understand the title of my book, she told Vibe in 2008, when she was planning a follow-up to her autobiography, Blame It on Vanity, called The Black Box. The black box is the only thing that survives a plane crash, and I want people to know that I'm a survivor. I go to wherever God calls me, wherever the church calls me to come to minister and preach the word of God. God told me, speak the kingdom of God with all your heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. Seek the kingdom of God first. In the beginning, I was planning on naming it Blame It on Vanity, Denise, but I wanted to separate myself from the sinful name that made me famous. Vanity means worthlessness, and that's the last thing I want to be known for. And I'm not worthless anymore. My name is Denise. Unfortunately, Vanity is not the only person who claims Prince ruined their lives. Another popular name that has emerged over and over is Sinead O'Connor. The career of Sinead O'Connor was inextricably linked to Prince in both success and personal controversy. O'Connor, who died in July this year at 56 years old, had a major hit song in 1990 with Nothing Compares to You, which appeared on her second album, I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. That song was originally written by Prince, but despite the chart-topping success of the track, the two singers had a contentious relationship. In 2013, the Irish singer hinted at the tension between her and the Purple Rain artist. She referenced a meeting with the Nothing Compares to You writer. Did I ever meet Prince? I did, and again, we didn't like each other at all, she told Uncut at the time. It got violent too, which is why I can't go into it, but it is a very funny story. O'Connor added while mentioning that she would likely someday include the tale in her late-life memoirs. By 2019, a few years after Prince's death in 2016, the I Want Your Hands On Me singer gave some insight into that fateful meeting and claimed that Prince had attacked her. We meet on the highway in Malibu at 5 in the morning. I'm spitting at him. He's trying to punch me, she said on Good Morning Britain. O'Connor also alleged that Prince was abusive to other female artists. True to her word, she offered more details about that the meeting in her book. O'Connor wrote about Prince in her 2021 book, Rememberings. According to the Thank You For Hearing Me singer, Prince was never happy that she repurposed Nothing Compares To You into her own hit song. Firstly, Prince didn't like people covering his songs, O'Connor wrote in her book. Secondly, he had all these female protégés, and he was annoyed that I wasn't one of them, she added. The Irish-born singer also alleged that the When Doves Cry artist had a history of being abusive. On top of all this, he was a woman-beating C asterisk asterisk asterisk. I'm certainly not the only woman he laid a hand on. The late Irish singer wrote in her book, the meeting between the two took place at Prince's mansion, where he displayed controlling characteristics, which included trying to force her to eat soup. At one point in the evening, Prince suggested a pillow fight, but slipped something hard into his pillowcase. That led to O'Connor eventually fleeing the mansion, but Prince chased after her in his car, and they had a confrontation on the highway. Prince starts chasing me around the car, telling me he's gonna kick the S asterisk 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 out of me, she wrote. Apparently, Prince partly acted out because he had legal issues with O'Connor's manager, Steve Fargnoli. O'Connor would later have her own legal issues with the singer. In September this past year, a documentary about Sinead O'Connor called Nothing Compares was released on Showtime. Despite how prominent her cover of Prince's Nothing Compares to You was for her career, her version of the song didn't make it into the film. In fact, Prince's heirs forbade it, according to Billboard. Sharon Nelson, one of Prince's half-siblings who was in charge of his estate at the time, said, I didn't feel Sinead deserved to use the song my brother wrote in her documentary, so we declined. His version is the best. Ultimately, the documentary's director, Catherine Ferguson, believes this was for the best. She told the outlet, initially, we had intended to use the song, but we received a refusal, which, as the rights holders, was their prerogative. In the end, we were very happy with that section of the film. It meant the focus remained on Sinead's words and on her own songwriting.
But just how dominating was singer Prince with his women? Are O'Connor and Vanity his only alleged victims of drug introduction? Throughout his nearly 40-year recording career, Prince surrounded himself with different women. From the revolution's first incarnation in 1979, which included keyboardist Gail Chapman, to his final backing band, all-female trio 3 Ardaya Girl, women were his collaborators, colleagues, and peers. They were his muses, like Patrice Russian, the R&B singer who reportedly inspired his first Top 40 hit, 1979's I Wanna Be Your Lover. And they were his paramours, as shown by his well-documented relationships with protégés like Vanity and Carmen Electra, his tabloid involvements with actresses Vanessa Marcille, Sherilyn Fenn and Kim Basinger, and his two marriages. Sometimes, as with drummer Sheila E., they were all of the mentioned. Women also gave new life to his songwriting. Prince liked our video for Hero Takes a Fall, and that led to him giving us Manic Monday. The Bangles' Susanna Hoffs told Billboard in 2010. We became friends. He would show up randomly at our gigs and jump on stage with his guitar. Once he had us over to a house he was renting and we jammed together for hours. He wanted to play our songs. It was incredible. Almost like a dream. Sheila E. is one famous woman Prince dated. <laughs> you know, you, you were in a relationship with Prince. He, he even proposed to you. How did he do it? <laughs> uh, it was during the sign of the times tour and uh... the drummer met prince in 1978 and became his bandmate lover and lifelong confidant we were together for so long i don't know when we weren't then there is patrice russian this jazz pianist and r b singer reportedly inspired prince's first top 40 hit 1979's i want to be your lover and turned down his future hit i feel for you Next up is Susan Moonzy. As the story goes, Prince wrote When Doves Cry about his relationship with this Apollonia Six member, who appeared in 1984's Purple Rain. After Moonzy, Vanity came into Prince's life, then almost immediately Stevie Nicks appeared. Little Red Corvette inspired Nicks to write her 1983 solo hit, Stand Back which features Prince playing uncredited keyboards. After Nick's came Apollonia. The daughter of Mexican immigrants, model singer Patricia Cotero, became one of Prince's most famous protégés with her co-starring role in Purple Rain. Not done yet, Prince then moved on to Wendy and Lisa. Lisa Coleman joined the revolution when keyboardist Gail Chapman left in 1980. Three years later, when guitarist Deezy Dickerson exited for religious reasons, she recommended her childhood friend Wendy Melvoin for her replacement. Together, they became essential partners in Purple Rain, the film and tour, and the 1986 movie Under the Cherry Moon. Prince also dated a host of other women, including Madonna, Ingrid Chavez, the 22-year-old poet who met Prince in a Minneapolis bar and became the muse for Love Sexy. She later played his love interest in 1990's Graffiti Bridge. At the time of Prince's death, his Paisley Park home and recording compound in Minnesota were strewn with a sizable amount of narcotic painkillers for which he did not have prescriptions, including some hidden in over-the-counter vitamin and aspirin bottles and others issued in the name of a close aide, according to a later released court documents related to the investigation into the accidental opioid overdose that the singer in 2016. Prince was found dead in the elevator of his home in Chanhassen, Minnesota on April 21, 2016, after he ingested a fatal amount of fentanyl, which is often used to manufacture counterfeit pills that are sold on the black market as oxycodone and other pain relievers. The singer's drug addiction definitely spilled over to all the women he brought into her life, vanity included. Prince's drug abuse is documented, with his fans appreciating his talent and, at the same time, acknowledging his shortcomings. One such fan tweeted, The artist formerly known as Prince should have been 62 today. The seven-time Grammy winner serves as yet another musical cautionary tale of drug abuse. So much talent just gone. Vanity's fans also remember her, especially for her stunning beauty. One of her fans fondly wrote, Denise's beauty is otherworldly, I swear. I couldn't even imagine what it was like seeing her in person. She was absolutely stunning. There you have it. Do you believe Vanity's life would have turned out differently were it not for Prince? Let us know in the comment section below. And that's it from us today. Until next time, thank you for watching.